Okay, we are back and we've got Mr. Todd Langford again for, we should just call this our myth-busting life insurance <laughs> course. So Todd, one of the biggest misconceptions that we hear in our industry is you can take these whole life insurance policies and be earning, you know, between three and 4% on the internal rate of return side. And then you can take a policy loan at 6% and you could actually get ahead by having a lower earning rate than you're paying at that interest because compound interest and simple interest. And so we hear this, we see this a lot from some of the big marketers that are out there, but the math doesn't quite pan out when we dive into that. So can we run some calculations to kind of figure out what's going on there and maybe separate these conversations so that people can get a better idea of what's going on? Sure. Boy, there was a whole list of things that you said in that 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 are that are potential issues, right? In the in the myth busting, and one of them that jumped out there was this idea of simple interest. And what I would encourage people to do is just get that out of your vocabulary because it doesn't exist, right? What simple interest literally means is that you have a loan that if you don't pay the interest, the interest doesn't compound inside the loan. There is no loan on the face of the planet that works like that. Sorry. Any outstanding balance is going to be attributed to whatever the interest rate is. If I choose not to pay interest in a loan that I have the ability to do that, right, like credit cards or life insurance policy or anything else, then that loan is whatever the balance is with the interest that I didn't pay is going to be charged interest the next year. Simple interest doesn't exist. So that's the first thing that needs to come back out of the language. But I think the reason it's there is to try to justify that conversation of, wait, I'm growing money at four and I have a loan at six and am I getting ahead? And there are advisors that will tell you that you are, but it's totally the wrong conversation. And what we talked about earlier, David, just before the call was the idea that those are two separate things and they absolutely are. Um, we need to think about it like this. Um, if I have money and let's say the bank's paying me 4% on CDs and I come in and I get take out a loan and I use that CD as collateral, those are two separate transactions. And so if the bank is charging me six, those two are not related. The only reason I would do that is come in and take a loan at six if I have money sitting at four is because I could put it in something to earn more than six, right? That's the only way that would make sense, but not those two together. And there are advisors that'll tell you that you would be getting ahead all day long if you had money sitting at 4% and you had a loan at six. And so let's dig into the numbers or is there something else we wanna talk about first? I think, David, if you wanna pull up some of those calculators, I'm just gonna add one more thought because you know, when you think about just banking in general, could a bank ever stay in business if they were paying their depositors more than what they were earning on their loan portfolio? Like <laughs> no business in the world can function like that, let alone an insurance carrier. Some of these have been around since the late 1800s that have been profitable for over a hundred consecutive years. So when you take an entity like that, that knows their math so well that they've been profitable for that long. Do you think really you're getting ahead by earning four and paying six? Do you think they're gonna let you do that inside their own company? They wouldn't be around for as long as they have been. So just me taking a step back and thinking about it, I already know there's no way that could be happening, but unfortunately we see it um, in a lot of marketing quick videos and it's very catchy. And if you don't understand how to break that down, I can see why it would be easy to get sucked into that and believe that this was actually happening. So let's let's break this down and really cover why that's not really happening so we can make better decisions in the future. Sure. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to convince you that it's true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to go down. I'm all in. <laughs> So I'm going to go down the road of the advisor that's saying this is hugely beneficial, having money set at four and having loans at six. And I'll show you how that's done. So let's get a future value calculator and let's put in, so let's use $100,000. So let's put $100,000 in the account earning 4% over 20 years. 
Okay, and so when we see that, we see that would grow to $219,112. So how much interest did we earn, right? Well, we would take the 219,112 that we end up with minus our 100,000 in principal, which would show us we actually made in interest $119,112 on that transaction. Okay, now we're gonna have to do this in two pieces. If you'll get me a um, payment calculator first. So at the same time, we have a loan of 100,000, so we'll put minus 100,000 on this loan. In the future, we want zero. And just to simplify this, I'm not gonna pay this back monthly. I'm gonna say this is a loan that we could pay annually. Actually, we could do that with our life insurance policy, right? We'll pay it back at the end of period. And at 6% over the same 20 year time frame. Okay, so that's $8,718.46. And if we get just a handheld calculator, we take the 8,718.46 times 20 payments over that 20 years is 174369 So to figure out how much interest we paid, we need to take our 100000 of principal off the front of it, right? And it means in interest, we paid $74,369. So my question mathematically then is $74,369 that we paid in interest less than 119,112 we earned in interest. Yes. Okay, that's absolutely true. So here's the thing. Mathematically, I just proved that what they said was true, that paying something at 4% or earning 4% and paying debt at 6% gets you ahead because we're gonna earn more interest in the compounding of this account versus we're gonna pay an interest on a declining interest loan. All right, that's true, and unfortunately, it's just a fun fact, okay? And what do I mean by that? <laughs> um, what I mean by that is this. Math in finance is very different than it is in grade school math. In grade school math, addition, subtraction, multiplication, algebra, it's all about whatever it is we're dealing with happening right now. When we get into financial math, it adds a third dimension. It's another piece and it's called time. You can't add money up over time and not include the impact of the time value of money in the conversation. If you have an incorrect formula, now my math was right here, wasn't it? I didn't, there's no mistake in my math. The mistake is in the formula and that is there's a big piece left out and it's the cost of money or the time value of money or the opportunity cost or whatever it is that you wanna call it along those lines. So in order for us to do this transaction we have right here, and this is gonna be something you're gonna to have to really think about, what did we have from the standpoint of our investment to make this happen? We had 100,000 up front that we could put in this 4% account, and we also had 8,718.46 per year that we paid against the loan, right? So we have both of those, and at the end of this time frame, the loan is at zero, and we have $219,112, correct? So net-net, at the end of the day, for putting 100000 plus $8,718 a year, we end up with two nineteen one twelve, dollars right? Yes. Okay, so now the next step. What if we took the 100000 and so you might want to just get another future value calculator, if I took the $100,000 and paid off the $100,000 debt down in that second, in that payment calculator, would that free up $87,1846 per year for the same cost as that first scenario that I could put somewhere else? So let's do that. So in this second one, take the 100 out, the 100,000 out. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, we took the 100 from above, we paid off the 100 in the middle, that freed up the 8718, and now I can invest the 8718 in that 4% account we took the 100 out of. 
And at the end of the day, the debt will be paid off because it was paid off day one. The money we flowed into this other account ends up being $259,000, which is a lot more than the 219 that we netted before, which is exactly what most people knew to be true. If most people were asked, could you have investments at 4% and take on debt at 6 just in that vacuum and be getting ahead? And the answer is no, right? We, we can't have costs higher than our than our uh, earnings. And it's, you know, it goes back to what you were talking about earlier, Kyle, with the insurance companies and everybody else. They all know that, right? The only way it works is if our costs are less than our investments. Okay, so would there be a reason to have money at four and have debt at six? Yes, but those two things are separate. The only reason we would take on the debt at six is if we could earn more than six somewhere else. So let's think about it back to our bank analogy with our CD as collateral. We might like having that liquidity of 4%, knowing that that money's safe and secure, having it at 4%, but an opportunity comes along to earn 10%. Well, we could take the four and put it in the 10 and get a great rate of return, but we would lose our certainty aspect. So it might be that we would want to put that up as collateral against a 6% loan from my bank and then go put that uh, in the 10% opportunity. And so really it's two separate transactions. The 4% earnings doesn't have anything to do, in this case, with the 6% cost. It's what did we do with that money from that point out? So Todd, one other element on there because from the first two examples, it it looks seemingly truthful, right? <laughs> and I think it comes from the book, I think it's in The One Thing by Gary Keller, where he talks about the word truthy. And it's not a real word, but it sounds like it is. And that is a very truthy example. If you were to see that, you would be a little bit bought in, like, I think that is happening. This is good until you break it down, because instinctively, you said it, you know, this is not happening. Savvy individuals know they cannot have an earning rate at four and a borrowing rate at six in the same, like you said, vacuum or economy and get ahead. You, you're you bleeding, you're dying every, every year because that loan interest rate is bigger than the earning rate. And so seeing that in that example, one is so helpful. And I think you're right. We have to separate this because when we're talking to individuals, that's not where the magic of this is happening. It's if I have $100,000 sitting at Chase Bank and they're paying me 0.5% right now, <laughs> could I move that savings environment to an insurance product that has more privacy, control, just as much liquidity, a loan provision built into it, a death benefit? There's way more economic value for me to keep my savings with a whole life policy. Once it's there and I've got my liquidity that's keeping me protected, could we use that as collateral to borrow from the insurance company at a 6% loan? And the only reason we do that is if we have an opportunity, like you said, to go earn 10 or 12 or 20%, whatever it is. That's the only way that that math works out in your favor long-term. Yep. One other thing on that, Todd, we hear this one a lot too, when we're seeing a policy, let's say earning four, and maybe the loan interest rate is five or six right now. We're seeing a lot of investors say, well, if I'm earning four and I'm borrowing at six, my cost of money is only 2% going forward. Now, that would kind of tie into that same type of truthy example, right? It kind of seems like it's happening, but can you break that one down for us too? Because we have to separate those as well. Yeah, that and that goes back to exactly the same argument on the other side, and that is those are two separate transactions. They don't have anything to do with each other. You know, a lot of times because life insurance is all, we get like a net number out of what is the net of the two accounts, but there's two totally separate things going on there. It's a lot easier to see when we think of it in terms of what the bank does. So let's say the same scenario occurred at the bank. The bank is willing to pay me 4% on a CD and I can put it up as collateral at for a 6% loan. Would anybody ever call that a 2% loan? No, they're two separate accounts. And the bank doesn't give us a statement that shows the two. They're going to give you a separate statement for your 4% and a separate statement for your 6% loan. And you're going to know that is a 6% loan. And the fact that it's got another asset at the bank, that doesn't make your loan rate less. And guess what? 
at the insurance company, it's the same thing. It's just that they do give us a statement that shows the two things together in one column. And I think that's where some of the confusion comes in sometimes. But we need to, in our mind, keep those totally separate. And there's something going on where we're earning on one side on the cash value, and a totally separate, unrelated transaction is the loan. Now, we did use the, the cash value and put it up as collateral, just like we would our CD at the bank. But outside of that, that's not going to change what the charge is on the interest rate. It, and Todd, to that same point, you know, uh, and we've talked about this many times at the number of trainings I've been to, uh, which have been quite a few, but, um, you know, sometimes people look at these things and they go, the magic is in the loan, right? Um, you know, I'm going to borrow my money out of my policy and, and, and they're even ignoring any interest rate conversation. They just think that they have to borrow against these policies and that's where the magic happens. And maybe speak to that real quick, because I think that that's a real powerful conversation. I think sometimes there's a, people in the investment world, or even the real estate world, that always feel that they have to have 100% of their money out doing something, uh, you know, 100% of the time. So maybe just speak to that real quick. Right. And so, you know, and where did the client get that idea that they need to do that? They got it from an advisor somewhere, right? That just went down the wrong path a little bit on their conversations. The loan provision is something that we would only take advantage of if it was something that would benefit us right? It does not drive the policy to perform any better or anything else. The loan is not where the power is. It's in that cash value growth. What out there, quite honestly, that is safe and liquid, so it has to fall into that category, earn in a net 4% plus, right? There's just that, that is that conversation on the safety side. And most people have money sitting in a checking account or in some safe place, don't they? Hopefully. Okay. They what's that? Hopefully. Should be, yeah. 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 And and but they don't look at that as, oh, you know, I'm not I need to borrow against that. I need to put that money up so it makes it bigger. No, nobody is gonna do that, right? That's not where that power comes in. But we need a place to store cash. That's what the cash value is for. Yes, when an opportunity comes along that we can take advantage of that's when we might want to take a loan out, not just to do it for the sake of doing it. That doesn't generate any momentum. In fact, I think a lot of people are forced to buy stuff that maybe is not a good deal just because they feel like borrowing money is going to somehow help. And so they're jumping on something and they're not looking at the point that, hey, I have a great place to store cash that's earning well that I can wait for the right opportunity. And then it makes sense to do it. Or to cover a certainty event. That's a big piece too. So, you know, I like to talk about the, I think I'm gonna use a new word, uh, the certainty asset versus the the opportunity emergency fund. We have the, the certainty fund could be that, that cash value because it's got guaranteed growth in it and it forms both of those roles, right? It lets us park money where we get a great rate of return and puts us in a position where we can wait until the right opportunity comes along because it's sitting there. And, um, you know, in, in relation to the whole certainty aspect, certainty idea, you know, one of the things that we've talked about is in order for people to have uncertainty, they need certainty assets. And it kind of works like this. Certainty is spice of life, right? Uncertainty is spice of life. Yeah. Certainty is boring, right? I mean, we need that, but it's boring, right? Why do people... Does anybody not think or not know that the casinos make all the money? And yet people still go, right? Even though they know that, that the casino is the one that's going to end up at the end. Why? It's that, it's that uncertainty. It's that spice of life that's, that's exciting. The, the problem is we have assets out there that are uncertainty assets that are fun. Real estate, equities, all of those things, they have their ups and downs. And even though it looks great on paper, right? So we can look at it. Everything's great. We have no idea what kind of black swan events going to come along, do we? No. And, and you know, what's funny about that is people say, well, you know, everything would have been great if it hadn't been for 9-11. It would have been great if it hadn't happened for COVID. And, and nobody knew that was coming. Well, yeah, nobody knew that was coming, but everybody should know something like that is coming. And it's going to happen again and again and again. To say exactly what that's going to be or look like, 
Who knows? But it will continue to happen. So what happens to those uncertainty assets that are exciting and potentially have a higher rate of return if that's all you have when one of those events happens? The result is you lose everything, right? Everything goes away. Now, what happens if you have certainty assets to protect those uncertainty assets? Now you're in a totally different position. So I've got these uncertainty assets, maybe it's in real estate, and now renters are down because of a pandemic or something along those lines. What in the world do I do? Well, I've got this certainty asset to make my mortgage payments to get me past it. Once we get to the other side of those events, who, who has not made a ton of money off of that scenario on the upside? Who are the people that lose? The people that are forced to sell when the emergency, when the black swan event hits, those are the ones that get hurt. Where did Kiyosaki, quite honestly, what, what happened to him? He was an investor in Arizona at the bottom of the market, right? He was in a position of cash and rode that thing all the way to the top. That is where we need to be. But if we're the people that have to sell under those black swan events, those are the ones that are going to get hurt. You've got to have the certainty to do it. You know, one of the things we talk about often is if you were putting your kids on a roller coaster for that uncertainty of the roller coaster, would you not fasten the seatbelt and make sure it's tight? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> you want the certainty, but uncertainty, but you got to have that certainty to, to keep you keep you on the ride. And so I think that's really an important piece. I was just going to add a comment. I, one of the quotes that I love from Buffett is um, uh, the best way to mitigate risk is to think. And for yeah, a guy sitting yeah. with hundreds of billions of dollars in liquidity waiting for something that doesn't like to sit on money, that's probably a wise advice to take. And, you know, I just want to say, like, you probably have had a great influence on me on this, Todd, like talking to a professional that can think about the things beyond a financial statement and reducing a conversation so broad to just comparing to interest rates is how you shot people's minds and not allow them to think. But when we have broader conversations, how do you put a value on the ability to have liquidity, flexibility, optionality, peace of mind, the things that are not sitting on a balance sheet? That part um, to me is huge. Even in, the, in, even in the loan provision itself, just reducing the loan to a five or four or six interest rate doesn't allow people to think and see the power of having an unstructured loan to having the power of decision being the owner and the loan officer. There's so much depth to this. So when you hear that, I just want to make uh, uh, that point that you made earlier. Separate these two things. One reason to put money in a life insurance policy has to do with how to use this asset as an environment for savings. Borrowing against it is a whole different thing, and it has a whole different analysis on opportunity cost that you need to think. So I love that you've brought to us that conversation. So thank you for your comments there. Thank you. And, and you know, I think another big piece that's left out is the death benefit piece that comes along with it. You know, any of these other assets that we're looking at other places to invest or whatever else, it, it, to protect our family, we're going to have to buy term insurance to, to make that happen. But I think there's even a bigger picture. And, and the bigger picture is so often in the financial industry, everything is about the accumulation phase. And nobody thinks, nobody steps back like you're talking about, David, where you step back and look at the big picture that's really outside of the numbers, outside of the math. It's like, how do I spend those dollars when I get there? What's going to be in place for me then so that I can actually spend money? And, and while a lot of people look at death benefit as being one of those things, oh, that's going to make somebody rich that's, you know, in my family or whatever else in the event that I'm gone. No, the reality is if it's positioned correctly, it will totally change that distribution phase and what's available from the standpoint of that individual, not their family, but the individual that has the life insurance to be able to spend those assets in the future in a much more uh, strategic way. And so the, the big picture going all the way to the end from the accumulation and then through the distribution, you know, there's things that need to be put in place now. And that's part of that big picture, right? I love it. Thank you so much, Todd. So hopefully anyone watching this is starting to understand that all the power is in the saving elements and the cash inside the insurance policy. That's what provides you the options to go do something in the future to generate more cash flow. But we have to separate those conversations and we have to trust that gut instinct that if we're earning four and paying six in the same environment, we are absolutely not getting ahead. So you can always go to our website, factumfinancial.com, and check out any of our free resources on our on our courses on whole life. 
And you can also go to truthconcepts.com and check out all of Todd's material. He's got lots of it as well um, on YouTube. Lots of good illustrations, all the numbers behind everything that we're talking about because it is so vital to know the math behind the decisions that we're making. So thank you again for being with us, Todd. Thank you.